I'll take this lull to uh, introduce Daphne and thank her for coming. Uh, very recent PhD from the University of Cambridge in uh, education, from a, especially sociology, sociological approaches in education. Uh, then very quickly became a researcher at UChicago, working in part in the periphery of the economics department. And then next is going to be bioethics postdoc at Stanford. So like your typical, you know, uh, so she's uh, worked, Daphne works at the intersection of education, genetics, and also ethics, I think, as you'll see. And um, also is an exemplar in a, a way of doing interdisciplinary research, which she'll, which she'll name and maybe rename later, uh, current name, adversarial collaboration. Um, and I think she'll draw on that hopefully a little bit later. And it's just a really interesting, I hope you'll agree, uh, I know you'll agree, a very interesting perspective that uh, circles around some of the issues that she'll be discussing. So please uh, hold questions in the beginning. She might uh, let you uh, start in the middle, depending on how things go. And um, join me in welcoming Daphne. Thank you very much for that. And, and clarification questions are OK. Feel free to throw those out here at any point. So as Jason mentioned, I've taken a little bit of an unconventional path. I think it's probably helpful if I describe a little bit how I came to the field that I'm now in. Um, I did an undergraduate degree in medical anthropology and at that time started working for a nonprofit education organization, which then got me interested in education. Uh, and so I went over to Cambridge to do some graduate work in education, uh, looking really at intersectional perspectives in education, how we think about equity, uh, and decided to stay for a PhD that combined those two interests, medical anthropology and education, mm -hmm. into uh, part of which I'm going to talk about today, which is looking at the social and ethical implications of social science genomics. Uh, social science genomics is a field that is interested in looking at behaviors and outcomes that we would typically think to have been socially influenced, things like household deprivation or income or educational attainment and looking at the possible role of genetics, genetic influence in how differences between uh, individuals <coughs> map out in society. Before I start though with that, I want to start with a story. So for my doctoral research, I did a mixed methods study. I was working with teachers in two schools in the Midwest uh, and also ran a national survey. Uh, and I was really interested in understanding what are teacher perceptions of the role and relevance of genetics for education. And when I was working with the focus group teachers, at the end of our time together, I volunteered up my services, basically, in their classrooms to help with anything they might, might need. And one day, I was working in a fifth grade classroom, uh, and we were doing, we just completed a reading on Katherine Johnson the African-American woman who calculated the shuttle trajectory for Alan Shepard, the first American into space. And the students had just gone and seen this movie a couple weeks before, and so they were asked to put together a mind map to take out key messages from that reading on Katherine Johnson. And this is one girl's mind map, her name's Brianna. And there was one thing that stood out to me in particular, and that is that she had written down, just because you're black, you can be smart. Just because you're black, you can be smart. Now, just because is a turn of a phrase, right? But it signifies uh, and it identifies a language of race and of deficit. And in its expression, I think it points to an injustice that Brianna understands. Uh, you know, she's saying that Katherine Johnson defies the societal perception that whiteness goes with intelligence. And this conflation of whiteness with cognitive exceptionalism is in part why a field like social science genomics is so contested and heavily debated. And it's a history that informs this very fraught terrain. Now, if we look at education, which is what I've been interested in for the past couple of years, education is thought to be an equalizer. Regardless of where you come from or your family income, we're all supposed to get access to the same quality education. In the U.S., it's considered part of the American dream, right? You climb up that ladder through education. But we really know that the notion of a meritocracy is far from realistic, and there's ample evidence of racial and socioeconomic disparities that have come to define a country like the United States. So education's no exception, right? Uh, 
racially defined minorities and low-income students are consistently left behind. They're educated in poorer quality schools with less experienced teachers, and teachers are more likely to perceive these groups of students negatively, more likely to see them as less capable than their peers. So education thus far is not operated as the equalizer it, sh it should be. So given this context, and I'm going to talk about context a lot today, given this context, the growing onslaught of genetic data concerning education-related behaviors like educational attainment, cognitive ability, ADHD, and dyslexia, they raise important questions about equity in educational spaces. So I titled this presentation The New Borderland, and I want to go over what I mean by that. The growing onslaught of genetic data in today's world is the new borderland. The recent mapping of the human genome has made genetics research increasingly prominent, and it's beginning to re-intersect with education research. The cost of DNA, sequences, DNA sequencing has dramatically decreased at a breakneck speed, and we've made great advances in the analytic methods that we have for processing large amounts of genetic data. So we're in a new phase of biological inquiry into human behavior. I have long been interested in how human societies create, embody, and legitimize borders, differences. On the one hand, we celebrate human difference. Each person's got a unique set of fingerprints. No one person is the same. But at the same time, we also use these differences to validate systemic and structural inequality. We use them to devise walls whether they're physical or metaphorical, between ourselves and others. And I think the question really for me is, what path will social science genomics lead us down? Will it add to these walls or will it help to break them down? Now, the emergence of this new borderland is best illustrated in this. I call this the floodgates have opened or the trains left the station. There's a lot of public conversation and public debate about the use of social science genomics, how genetic data is now being used to help us understand more about human life and human behavior. And we see a lot of polarization in that as well. We have articles that say denying genetics isn't shutting down racism, it's fueling it, and others that say sociogenomics is opening a new door to education, uh, to eugenics. Between uh, 2003 and 2006, the NIH invested between 50, 560 and $570 million in genetics research alone. We're seeing a growing consumer genetics movement with people able to get kits from between $100 to $200 through companies like 23andMe that will tell them more about themselves in very easy to use, neatly wrapped toolkits. Given this context, what is genetics and education? What's happening in this field? The past couple of years, past five years actually, we've seen increased calls for incorporating genetic information into education. And this has led to debate over the relevance and role of genetic data for educators, not just education researchers, but educators themselves. The arrival of genetic data at the schoolhouse door has both generative and problematic context for assessing the links between race, class, and equitable access. It's a reality, and by reality I mean the arrival of genetics at the schoolhouse door. It is a reality that makes some optimistic, makes others nauseous, downright worried. But it's important to understand throughout all of this the historical context of this debate that make the present reality of genetics uh, one that we need to think of from a very critical perspective. Okay, so I'm sure many here are familiar with Schoolhouse Rock. Uh, had my sister do some graphic design to create Schoolhouse Risk with the PGS superhero. Uh, one of the most important developments in recent years is the Genome-Wide Association Study, or GWAS. GWAS investigate the entire genome and identify SNPs associated with a particular behavior or trait. Um, most importantly, they cannot on their own specify causality, so they're just highlighting correlations. Uh, but findings from GWAS for complex traits like cognitive ability, and by complex traits I'm meaning traits that are not influenced by one gene, right? So there's no intelligence gene uh, 
intelligence, as these uh, researchers would say, is a polygen polygenic trait. So it's influenced by many genes, each with a small effect size. Polygenic scores are meant to summarize all the identified genetic information pertaining to a given trait. And it's dispersed so widely throughout the genome that you need to aggregate them into the scores to get a better understanding of the influence, genetic influence. Now, when I talk about schoolhouse risk, I'm talking about more than polygenic scores and how polygenic scores might be used in education. There are many possibilities for how genetic data might be used in education, and each has their own sets of risks and potential benefits that ought to be weighed. And I acknowledge that there are far more uses for genetic data than what I'm going to talk about today. So if, if you look more broadly at the field of biosocial sciences, there are efforts in epigenetics, in neuroscience, in social science genomics, uh, around education-related behaviors. I, today, am just going to focus on social science genomics, but I just want to acknowledge that there, is, uh, there are a number of efforts from other scientific disciplines that are also focused on this. Um, and I want to focus in particular on one argument that's being used about how genetic data might be used in education. That's personalized education. In part, I've decided to focus on this today because I think it's a big part of the conversation that's happening. It's something that gets a lot of media attention. Uh, and it's something that is a little bit more accessible to lay populations than, say, uh, the argument that you might be able to use genetic data as a control variable in social science research. The idea of personalized education is something that just sticks with the public a little bit more and is being uh, talked about in public spheres with a little bit more uh, frequency. So, those who advocate for personalized education see integrating genetics into education research as a way to optimize educational processes. Uh, I focus in particular on this man here. Uh, his name is Robert Plowman. He's at King's College London. He's actually a Chicago native, coincidentally. Uh, but in 2013, he co-authored this book, G is for Genes, The Impact of Genetics on Education and Achievement, with Catherine Asbury, who's at the University of York. Through personalization, these researchers argue that their work could provide earlier and more tailored career advice, help decide on the tracking and streaming of students, and allow parents to request specific educational focuses based on their child's genetic data. They talk about how understanding uh, the role of genetics could help to avoid erroneous assumptions that are sometimes made in schools. And they go as far as to list 11 policy proposals for what they call genetically sensitive schooling, which includes creating an individualized education plan for each child that takes into account, in part, their genetic data, but also the environmental uh, factors that, that are impacting upon the child. They argue that personalizing education is the best way to realize the potential of individual children who are, quote, naturally different. Uh, I want to take a moment to look at some of these policy points that they've presented, each of which they've got an accompanying rationale for that is taken from findings in uh, behavioral genetics, which is a sub-branch of social science genomics. Okay, so the first is the idea that we are all genetically different. Based on this premise, they propose that the national curriculum, you know, they're based in the UK, but this would be similar to something like uh, Common Core, should only cover basic skills like reading, writing, and numeracy. And that it's all a student has to do is to pass an examination that covers those basic skills in order to graduate from the K through 12 system. They can take this examination at any point within that spectrum, depending upon when they are, think they're ready for it, when their teachers think they're ready for it. Uh, and so the basic skills would culminate in this final pass-fail certificate test. Okay, another one is gene environment correlation depends on choice. So here they're saying increase the range of subject options available to students and give teachers more freedom in their lessons. The choice argument is something that we hear a lot about in education today, school choice, allowing families and students to choose which schools they want to attend, uh, courses that they want to take. So this slots into this pre-existing argument. It's familiar in some sense. And I'm going to go into more detail about once I get to some of the results when I ask teachers what they think about this, uh, why I think that they responded the way that they did. So 
they write that it makes good genetic sense for students to have the opportunity to weigh their education in, in favor of their passions and talents. By increasing options in schools, you're going to allow kids to choose those courses that they are more inclined to be interested in uh, and to uh, develop a talent for. Okay, third one, I'm just going to go through three of these policy points out of the 11 for now. But one, preschool children are especially susceptible to the effects of shared environment. So they say we should offer free, high quality education to disadvantaged children from age two free high quality preschool to all children from ages three to four and extra support to children in low SES families from birth. I think regardless of the genetic argument that that's, they're using as their rationale for this proposal, many of us, probably all of us in this room would think that this would be a great policy to implement in schools. But they argue that um, offering free high quality preschool to disadvantaged children could mitigate the impact of shared environment particularly on children who are living in environments that might be considered toxic, which uh, low-income children are more likely to find themselves growing up in. Okay, so I was interested in what do teachers think about this? What do teachers think about the role and relevance <coughs> of genetics and genetic data for education? To better understand this, I ran a mixed methods study that included a 37-item, three-section online survey. Uh, and the focus groups at two contrasting schools. So at the very beginning when I talked about that student, Brianna, she was coming out of a school that was uh, a public charter school, predominantly low income, predominantly African American. I worked with teachers at that school. I also worked with teachers at uh, an opposing school, so a private school that was gifted education focused. Families paid $19,000 a year in tuition, predominantly white, predominantly high income. Uh, and I spent several months with these teachers talking to them about their perceptions of intelligence and their views on whether genetic data might have some utility uh, within education. So the survey, unfortunately, is non-representative, but I uh, did manage to get 660 pre-K through 12 teachers from public, private, and charter schools across the United States all states except Montana and Delaware. <laughs> uh, and I wanted, there were three questions that I really wanted to answer in this. The first was, what are teacher perceptions of the role of genetics in student differences? I also wanted to know, what are teacher perceptions of precision education? So by precision education, I mean that idea of genetically sensitive schooling that Asbury and Plowman talk about in the book, She is for Genes. And the third is, how do teachers conceptualize intelligence and socioeconomic status in relation to genetics? Now, as a side note, I also asked teachers how they conceptualize race in relation, relation to genetics. I decided not to include that in today's presentation, and I'm happy to go over why, but I'm going to focus on intelligence and socioeconomic status for now. Okay, and then to do this, I, uh, part of it involved uh, a scale where I asked teachers from zero to 100, where do you think intelligence would fall? Where do you think socioeconomic status would fall? Okay, so for this first one, what are teacher perceptions of the role of genetics in student differences? Now to do this, what I really wanted was to have teachers look at primary source accounts from these researchers. And when I talked about earlier the slide that had all that chaos on it, there are a lot of public facing uh, materials from these researchers in social science genomics, behavioral genetics, that are easily accessible to teachers. YouTube videos, the book like Gs for Genes, which was written specifically for educators and policymakers. Uh, these kinds of primary source materials, I wanted to know how teachers interpreted it directly from the source. And so I showed teachers a video clip of Robert Plowman uh, that he had created for educators, talking about the utility of behavioral genetics for education. So first I took extracts from that video and I wanted to ask teachers the extent to which they disagree disagreed or agreed with those statements. So, uh, and by agree, I've included somewhat agree, agree or strongly agree. I'm happy to give that breakdown if, everyone, if anyone wants more specifically, but over 90% agreed with the statement that Plowman made. Not only do children differ in how easily they learn, but it's also, in sort of, it's also sort of in what they learn and what they like to learn. Again, over 90% agreed with the statement, children differ and they differ genetically. Over 80% with don't just automatically blame teachers in schools and parents realize that genetics is important. 
And then finally, around 60% agreed with the statement, a student's genetics play an important role in their success in the classroom. Um, and just to, I'm going to break that out a little bit. So, you know, we had 45% that said, that agreed with the statement, um, oh, sorry, 47% who agreed with the statement, who said they strongly agreed with the statement, children differ and they differ genetically. Okay. So then, what were teacher perceptions of precision education? So I showed teachers all 11 of these policy points, including the rationale given, the genetic rationale for why that policy point should be implemented in schools, and I wanted to know what their thoughts were on it. Um, okay, so we had uh, about two-thirds of teachers who felt that these 11 policy points would have a positive impact on the American education system. I w also wanted to ask teachers specifically how they thought this would impact or, or serve historically underrepresented groups in education. 72% felt that these policies would positively affect low-income and ethnic minority children. Now part of the appeal, I think, of these policy points, and as I gave the example of that preschool one, is that they touch upon very pressing and real uh, issues in education, um, such as differential access to ed quality education. So it can be difficult to navigate between seeing these policy points as ones that are genetically informed and seeing them as proposals that simply make sense, as one of the teachers I was working with said. Who wouldn't want to offer a free, high-quality preschool? Asbury and Plowman evoke a kind of humanitarian language to push forward these policy proposals that I think speak to teachers who work in high-stakes teaching environments uh, where they are under a lot of pressure. Now, I just want to give one little anecdote. So I spoke to one behavioral genetics researcher uh, about their use of genetic data in education and they said that there's a big push to want to compensate teachers based on the rate at which their students are learning. So this is the high stakes teaching environment that teachers are in now. You give them a test at the beginning of the year, you give them a test at the end of the year, and you see how much the students improve. Now this researcher said maybe that teacher whose students are doing well, they get a bonus. But if you really wanted to do that fairly, you'd want to know the genetic potential of those kids because you might be rewarding that teacher for just having very talented students. And maybe the teacher's not actually a better teacher. So to be fair about incentive structures for teachers, you might want to have some idea of the quality level of students and maybe genetics could help to inform that. All right. So I also asked teachers uh, whether tailoring an individual education plan based on an individual's genetic profile would change their views of these policy points. Six, over 65% said that they, uh, it would not. Um, interestingly, I also asked teachers whether they thought adding a course in teacher training on the genetics of learning would be uh, beneficial for practitioners because this was one of the policy recommendations that Asbury and Plowman made, that teachers should be educated in the genetics of learning and education. Oh, you know, just over 40% thought that uh, this would be beneficial, but a higher percentage, around 47%, were unsure. I think the key thing to pick up from this is that very few people thought it would not be, that it would be actively bad or harmful in some way. Okay, so back to this. So I then gave teachers the opportunity to reflect on the ideology of socioeconomic status and intelligence uh, as they understood it. And there were a wide array of responses. I just want to draw out uh, this one from Florence, who was one of the focus group teachers I worked with. She said Dweck, and she's referring to Carol Dweck, who uh, has pushed forward that growth mindset movement, if you've heard of it. She said Dweck would, would be like, the sky's the limit. But that's a bull-faced lie, isn't it? Because of different things, social constructs, the way systemic things, and then I really, and I know it might be like totally taboo to say, but I do believe everybody is given a different measure of whatever that is. So how did teachers conceptualize intelligence in relation to genetics? That status should be removed. Uh, out of the survey respondents, I had one respondent who said, um, I know genetics is hugely controversial because in a democratic society, we believe we can influence outcomes. Honestly, I always wanted to believe this, but I've seen families where with modest interventions, children have been exceptionally successful, and others where the children have had to work extremely hard to keep up. And she demonstrates, this respondent demonstrates what I think is a real tension between the idea of equality 
or the blank slate philosophy, the idea that we're all born with equal set of abilities, uh, and genetics research, and the idea that there are genetically influenced dif individual level differences. Equality is a core premise of the American dream, right? We say all men are created equal. So talking about genetics may seem incompatible with the tenets of a democratic society, as this respondent, I believe, is alluding to. And it's this tension that I think also underpins, in addition to the historical context, many of uh, the feelings of anxiety people have around genetic, informa genetic research in social science. Um, but outside of these kind of anecdotal reflections from the survey and the focus groups, what happened when I asked teachers to quantify genetics in terms of, uh, quantify intelligence in terms of genetics and the environment? In other words, if we ask teachers how big a role do you think nature versus nurture plays when it comes to intelligence, what are they saying? Okay, so this is a sliding scale question. Uh, of the 660 survey respondents, the average position of intelligence on the sliding scale was just over 50. Um, now I want to talk about this in relation to what the field of social science genomics and behavioral genetics says right now. So pedigree analyses of inte intelligence, so that would be things like twin studies, uh, say that have reported that genetic differences can account for between 50 and 80 percent of the phenotypic variation. Uh, about 50 percent uh, of differences in intelligence and 40 percent of differences in education can be explained by genetic effects when a large number of rare SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, are included. So in some sense, teachers are not that far off from what the field of behavioral genetics is saying. And it suggests that rather than this idea that we have in our society of a nature versus nurture debate, teachers are seeing this more of a nature and nurture conversation. Um, okay, so socioeconomic status. How did teachers conceptualize socioeconomic status in relation to genetics? So I had one survey respondent uh, and I'm happy to also explain why I've included their political affiliation. That was something I was really interested in. And I can go into that if people have more questions. But they said, research demonstrates that genetics is the pr principal determinant of both intelligence and key traits such as conscientiousness. The genetic lottery does play a role in socioeconomic status since smarter people tend to have better socioeconomic status on average. Differences between overlapping bell curves between races can be larger than differences between overlapping bell curves between different genders. Of course, the difference between intelligence and high intelligence, uh, the difference between the intelligence of high intelligence, low intelligence members of any one group is larger than disparities between groups. So when I looked at um, the sliding scale question, the average position of socioeconomic status on the sliding scale was around 30 out of 100 points. If we look at social science genomics, previous genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, uh, use household income as a marker of socioeconomic position. And they've shown that common genetic variants can account for about 11 percent of this variation. Um, so perhaps teachers, in some sense, uh, are overestimating the impact. Uh, but there is also the issue of the missing heritability problem. And so uh, the genetic variants that have been found in relation to many human behaviors do not always match up with the genome-wide association studies. So heritability estimates tend to be a lot higher than uh, the genome-wide association studies and the uh, percent of variation that they're able to account for. Okay, so given what I have found, the fact that many teachers think genetics play a role in education, um, potentially an important role, Given, in, uh, given the context in which the American education system is situated, we've got an ugly history as well of using eugenics to legitimize ras race and class-based differences. Um, how do we think about a future that is very uncertain? What are things that we should keep in mind as we move forwards? Uh, in other words, what should we keep in the front of our minds in a world where researchers say educational attainment is heritable? and in which many people at the same time are seeking social, educational, economic, and political access, opportunity and equality. Are these things necessarily inherently in tension with each other? Or a world where there are very real social and environmental factors that have grave life and death implications for individuals. Where there's a risk, we might call it the schoolhouse risk, that polygenic scores could distract from efforts that are aimed at equity. <coughs> 
And finally, a world where there are genetic and biological ideologies and language that are used to validate racism and classism. Context matters. I cannot stress that enough. So, first thing I think we should keep in mind is human history and genetic diversity. Human history is very deeply intertwined with our genome. In fact, if we look at the, the consumer genetics movement, the growing movement there, individual interest in one's own genetic history is in part what's fueling that movement. Um, genetic diversity can be a scientific treasure, but it's also going to require a more careful study uh, given that genetics and history are so intertwined. Genetic history, genetic differences might be a viable means for uh, understanding divergent outcomes between individuals who might otherwise come from comparable starting points, like siblings, but attempts to use genetic differences to explore variation in complex traits between individuals or groups, racial groups, that experience manifestly unequal environments is a fraught endeavor at the very least. Uh, it will be nearly impossible to isolate the effects of genetic differences from the effects of environmental differences, given both the severe levels of socioeconomic stratification that we have across societies, uh, and, and also that many, uh, most of the a lot of the stratification that we do see in these societies across groups, uh, and the group differences we see, so perhaps racial differences, are associated with dramatic differences in the ways that we experience our environments. The other point I want to say on this is that genetic ancestry cannot be conflated with race. So ancestry, as genetics use it, a genesis use it, re refers to an individual's place on the many branching trees of genealogical descent. And while we all share the same extensive tree, ancestry captures genetic similarities of individuals due to more recent common forebearers. And so ancestry is an individual characteristic. You can almost think of it as a fingerprint. Um, while race is uh, a more socially defined process. It's something that we construct uh, based on where someone's living or certain social perceptions that we have of people. And so it's critical um, that we understand that the relationship between ancestry and race is one that's very dynamic and that they cannot be conflated with each other. Okay, the second thing, and this is something that I'm particularly interested in, is the unequal access to precision service services. Um, so if personalized medicine or perhaps personalized education becomes precise for only certain groups of people, it runs the risk of becoming a driver of inequality rather than perhaps a systematic means to improve public health or public education. And I think that there are two sides of the coin when it comes to this. The first is the focusing on the capabilities of the research itself. So at the present moment, most genome-wide association studies focus on individuals of northern European ancestry, which means that this cannot be generalized to other ancestral populations. Indigenous and minority groups are dramatically underrepresented in uh, these genome-wide association studies. And it also is important to recognize that um, individuals of European ancestry or Northern European ancestry is quite genetically homogenous. So what that means is someone who's maybe living in Denmark in terms of ancestry and someone who's in Norway in terms of ancestry are more likely to be genetically similar than two people who are living in Nigeria two miles away from each other. Um, which again goes back to, the, to why you cannot use race as a proxy for ancestry. Uh, these, many of these GWAS do not generalize to all humans. The other thing, second part of this coin, is that um, the misdeeds of previous generations, you know, if we look at Tuskegee, there is a great mistrust from certain communities about engaging in biomedical research. Uh, and perhaps as the consequences of these experiences, we see that there's a reduced enrollment in genotyping amongst African Americans. Okay, the second thing deals with the social and ethical implications of precision services. So as the commercialization of genetics advances, policymakers and educators will have to consider the implications of genetic testing, whether it's con conducted inside or outside of schools. Uh, higher income people tend to more quickly respond to new health-related information. They've got more resources, uh, are more likely to, um, yeah, are more likely to uh, seek services such as these, and 
On top of that, when we look at what kinds of schools, if we're looking at precision education, what kinds of schools would be the most likely to respond to a parent that, say, walks through the door and says, I just took my child to our pediatrician, we got him genotyped, he's predisposed to develop dyslexia, please put in place a reading intervention now to help mitigate whatever effect that might later manifest itself. If certain information only becomes actionable in certain schools, uh, precise for certain communities or utilized by certain communities, consumer genetics movement could further divide opportunities available to students from different socioeconomic uh, and social backgrounds. Um, inequality due to differential access to genetic screening is particularly unsettling in prenatal genetic uh, screening, and it has the possibility to translate social inequality into genetic differences. So what I mean by that, it's already common, for example, for families to conduct genetic testing uh, in utero to, for disorders like Down syndrome or Tay-Sachs or cystic fibrosis. Uh, parents can also use in vitro fertilization to select more specific attributes like the sex of their child. And perhaps we can see a world in which this evolves and parents with means and resources go beyond simply trying to screen their children for things like learning disabilities or severe developmental dis dis uh, disorders, and also choose to screen their unborn children for social, socially valued traits like cognitive ability or athleticism. So as we begin to better understand uh, the genetic basis for a wide range of characteristics, differential access to such screening practices could create new gaps in the genetic risks for valued life outcomes. Uh, and it could further strain the role of public education, a role which is already strained as we've talked about when it comes to equalizing opportunities across individuals. Okay, and I'm gonna skip this because I think I'm running out of time, but Discrimination based on genotype is incredibly uh, important. GINA 2008 law, which tries to prevent discrimination against genotype, has many loopholes, particularly if we look at life insurance and disability. This is a great Twitter that you should follow if you want to learn more about it. Uh, it's run by John November at the University of Chicago. Um, so given these things that I've said that we should keep in mind, what is a potential mechanism we can use to ensure that we're creating socially responsible research, that genetics research is used as much as it can be for a force of good rather than to further racist, classist, and inequitable purposes. And this is the adversarial collaboration that Jason had talked about. Uh, I advocate for adversarial collaboration as a mechanism for socially responsible communication in social science genomics. And I mean communication with the public, but also between research communities. Um, adversarial collaboration is a research partnership that brings together people from different and at times opposing disciplines and viewpoints. And I think that's really key because it's not just uh, cross-disciplinary. You might have people who are in the same department who have different views of an issue. It's a joint research effort that's focused on engaging and forming a richer collaboration to result in better communication. So it will, in, I, in theory, help to improve public in engagement, temper claims, be explicit about what a research study can and cannot do, and respond to the misinterpretation and mis use of research in a both proactive and reactive format, all of which is to ensure that genomics is used as a force for good and works in the interests of even the most vulnerable communities in our society. I came about the idea of adversarial co collaboration um, just by happenstance. I was at a special interest group meeting at the American Educational Research Association conference and someone just threw it out, but at the time I was working on a project with two colleagues at Stanford who are more and more entering into the, the field of social science genomics. And it really described what we were doing because we were coming from different viewpoints. I think I was uh, a lot more tempered and perhaps skeptical about the potential promises of genetic research uh, for education than they were. And we were working on this collaborative paper to try and explore the promises and pitfalls of genetics research in a world where we've got a very ugly history when it comes to using it and where the future is very uncertain. So to end, uh, I just want to go through the, I've been thinking recently about whether the term adversarial is the right one to use. I find that when I first introduce it to people, they have a little bit of a reaction to the idea of adversary. Uh, maybe it's a little too strong for some people. Uh, so, I mean, I like it, but 
We could also think of it as an expansive collaboration. Um, and my hope is that a research effort like this one, you know, it might start as more of an adversarial collaboration between researchers who have different viewpoints, but it's going to come, we're going to be able to reach some sort of consensus. And I think the important thing is, in the strictest term of adversaries, a collaborative effort like this will not necessarily be effective. You need people who are at least willing to listen to the other side and respect the opinions of another, even if they don't necessarily agree with it. But I think that given the polarization that we see in public spaces around what genetic data might be used for, we're going to at some point need to stop talking past each other and start talking with each other. Uh, and perhaps one day we might get to a space where we see this more as an expansive collaboration rather than an adversarial one. But focusing on uh, critical discourse. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <coughs> Fabulous. This is wonderful um, and super interesting. And there's much to be said about the earlier parts, but I want to start with adversarial collaboration. Um, because I think you're entirely right, and I think you should, I'm going to encourage you to stay, stay firm on, on, your, on your word choice. Because when we think more broadly about all kinds of interdisciplinarity, um, too often we sort of do this additive thing where we're going to do um, anthropology and demography, and we're going to call it anthropological demography, and we're going to take the best from each. But actually, we don't learn anything when we do that. Or we very rarely learn something because it is the conflict, it is the place where this discipline fundamentally disagrees with that assumption and vice versa, that we really have the potential to learn something different. And so I'm just gonna encourage you to, to stay with adversarial. Um, but I, what, I wanted, what I wanted to ask about it is, do you think it has to be, does it, what are the multiple ways, or what is the best way to do this, in the sense that if we think about in the context of one project, I can see how that could work. What about in the context of graduate training? Like, would you entertain adversarial graduate training? Or, or like, tell us a little bit more about where and how this thing can happen. Absolutely, that's a great question. I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, you know, obviously I started with that one example where we were working on one paper together, but I think I'm a huge supporter of having difficult conversations, interdisciplinary conversations, and so I think that that should be a central component of graduate education. That's a great idea. I think the difficult thing is, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday at dinner, but field like the social sciences can be very siloed, and so it can be difficult to um, really engage in those in those collaborative works in a meaningful way. I think you're going to have to, you're going to face a little resistance at first, and um, and you're going to have to push the envelope a little bit in terms of uh, continuing to talk about how important this is and showing cases in which it's worked and the outcome. And I think on, you know, on our project, one thing that I really learned from it was how to translate my writing, so to speak. So we spent a lot of time, I, can, I was talking yesterday about we had this one six hour phone call where we were literally going through the paper and seeing, okay, is this going to be understood by educators and education researchers? Is this going to be understood by the social science genomics community? How can we make that language meet a middle ground so that it's accessible to both? Uh, because we, we felt that if we were to write a paper that was very much positioned within education research, it was going to be off-putting to social science genomics researchers. They weren't going to want to read it. Vice versa, if we create a highly technical paper with a lot of scientific jar jargon, that wasn't going to be accessible to education researchers either. And so creating work that's more accessible to multiple publics is what's going to help disseminate it farther and I think that that is a really valuable and important skill for people to learn, whether in graduate school or beyond or earlier. Just because I know this paper, uh, um, one of your co-authors actually came to give a talk here uh, a few years ago and people had different kind of responses to this talk and so I think the group would love to hear just a little bit more about how you got started on this, and what the ground, were their ground rules, um, <laughs> and what was the scope? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think we started very generally, so um, in the sense that we kind of decided very broadly, let's write a paper about genetics and education, and we think it would be good to write it with each other because we do not always see eye to eye, and in the field of education right now, there's a lot of 
uh, anxiety and perhaps resistance to the idea of social science genomics. And then in social science genomics, there's a lot of, there's this perception that, um, you know, and I experienced this myself where, oh, you don't fully understand the science and the methods. You're just critiquing this without truly understanding what it is that we're doing or trying to do. Uh, and so we basically wanted to create a paper that would be accessible to multiple audiences. We did lay some ground rules in terms of if there was anything that made someone feel uncomfortable that they didn't fully um, want, they didn't fully agree with or buy into, uh, we would either find a way to temper the language, so perhaps find a more middle ground, or we would, we would table it for another conversation. Um, but that was pretty much the only ground rule that we laid. I think, I think, and that's part of why I have some, I'm having some thoughts about the term adversarial collaboration because we were all willing to listen to the other side and to arrive at that middle ground. We went into the project saying we are going to create a paper that sits in that middle ground. Um, and so that's a basic premise of having something like this work. No more questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is less part of the larger conversation, more about the, the study that you did at the yeah. beginning of the presentation. Um, I'm actually, those sliding scales really confuse me. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you could go to one of the slides. I don't know if it's sitting at 30%, if that means, yeah, so if that means that you're attributing <coughs> A little over 70% to nature, or you're attributing 30% to, um, I, would, I don't know how I would fill this out. Mm, okay, okay, I see what you're saying. No, that's a very good question. So when I gave this to, um, to the survey respondents, I said, um, how would you define intelligence or socioeconomic status or race? And I said, with zero being purely environment, environmental factors and 100 being purely genetic factors. And so they just toggle the scale to, you know, to what extent do I think this is genetically influenced? Was the response bimodal or did it? There was a lot of variation in responses. Uh, and I think that that also speaks to, I wish I had put the histograms in the appendix here. Um, but there was, there was a lot of spread in responses. And I think that that also speaks to the fact that a lot of people, um, there isn't, mass consensus around uh, the role to which genetics play a role. And that, you know, part of the reason why I didn't include when I asked teachers about race in this is because uh, I had a conversation afterwards where I realized, well, how do I know if teachers are talking about race in terms of self-identified race or if they're talking about ancestry? And so because I couldn't parse that out, I've decided I need to rework that a little bit. So what did they say when you did have race with the results? Yeah, so race was around 60, so people thought it was higher. So that, that made me think that perhaps they were thinking of something more along the lines of ancestry, but I, I would have been really interested if I had made them do race and ancestry, what the differences would have been in their responses, and I wish I had done that. Unfortunately, I didn't. Um, I think you mentioned earlier, like in some of the quotes, that uh, you had asked people about their political affiliation, yeah. and mm -hmm. I was wondering how how often you found, um, like I guess my personal assumption would be if someone identifies as very liberal, they would not be pro incorporating genetics yeah. into it, right? So how often do you find kind of a dissonance between those ideas? Yeah, that, that was, I did have that question, which is why I decided to ask political orientation in there. Uh, and I did run regression on the sliding scales. There was, pretty much nothing significant, which was really, I mean, the one interesting thing that was significant was on the race um, sliding scale. I found that white teachers were more likely than teachers of color to see race as a biological or genetically influenced um, characteristic. But when it came to political orientation, there were a couple of really random where it would be like this extremely liberal was more, was less likely to see uh, the role of genetics, but the pattern wasn't um, cohesive enough that for me to think that there was anything of substance there. And it's self-identified? Yeah, okay. yeah, self-identified political orientation. And so part of the reason why I put this one up is because, you know, I didn't really see that pattern by political orientation. And here's someone who responds as extremely liberal who's saying that the genetic lottery does play a role in socioeconomic status. And so I use that as an example to show that this idea that liberal, liberal members of society um, 
are less open to the idea of genetics might not necessarily be the case. Perhaps they're not as open about it, but um, under the guise of an anonymous survey, they might feel more comfortable. Do you have a sense of where the genetics or the personalized features rank relative to other dimensions from a teacher's perspective as far as challenges in actually teaching? Of course, I'm thinking of, so there, there's the genetics, there's the environment at home, there's the environment within school, within school. So I'm just yeah. curious yeah. where no, genetics falls in the minds of teachers on other pressure. Yeah, so I didn't put this in here, but I did ask teachers to, to rank in order of importance different factors that they thought affected a child's uh, a, a educational achievement. So they were things like neighborhood environment, uh, home environment, um, genetics, gender, socioeconomic status, it's like an inter intersectional look. And the single most important thing that teachers identified pretty much unanimously, it was over 50%, said that um, parent and home life was the single most important factor in a child's educational achievement. So, um, you know, and genetics fell, I think it was fifth. So it's right in the middle in terms of how they ranked it for importance. Given that, do you have a sense of what genetics means <laughs> to people yeah. when they're answering this question? If it's something distinct than their parents and their home life and all these other yeah. like, no, what, what is it that they think that, that it is? I was, I did wonder whether having like parent um, and home life, if you could clearly parse that out from genetics. Um, but, uh, you know, honestly, I'm not sure in terms of. Um, whether they were making a distinction between those two when they were answering that question. I mean, when, they, when I looked through the kind of anecdotal responses in the survey, and then when I spoke with teachers more in the focus groups, um, you know, in the focus groups particularly, teachers talked a lot about segregation uh, and how that impacted child's performances in the classroom. So at least from the focus groups, teachers were making a little bit a, a, more of a distinction between uh, parent home life and, and genetics, they were thinking of it more of in terms of the actual environment in which a child was growing up and living, rather than um, maybe something that parents have passed down to the kid. Hi, I was wondering if you were able to look at variations by years of experience of the teacher. Yes, I did look at that as well. I should have just gone through the regressions. <laughs> I, did, I did also look at the age of the teachers. The only thing, the only, there was one slight pattern, which was that the older a teacher was, the more likely they were to see these, uh, in particular, intelligence as genetically influenced. Um, so, you know, that, that raises important questions about whether, you know, younger teachers coming in, they are, you know, full of more energy, they are maybe more bought into the blank slate philosophy and how can we help those teachers to continue holding that mindset as they go through their careers. Um, if, you know, in particular there was a, teachers who were over the age of 65 especially showed up as more likely to see intelligence as genetically influenced. Oh, so my question is Michal. Um, how did, uh, how did the, do you have a sense of how the teachers uh, understood intelligence and then also how do researchers uh, operationalize? Yeah, yeah, so when I gave them the survey and in the focus groups, um, they were looking at, so in the focus groups, the first session we were looking at different definitions that are out there for what intelligence is. So we had definitions from behavioral geneticists, uh, they're talking about G, we had, um, other arguments on the other end of the spectrum that were saying intelligence is a socially constructed idea. And so I asked teachers in the focus groups to talk about where they fell within that spectrum. Um, when it came to the survey, uh, I had teachers watch a video clip of Robert Plowman in which he talks about intelligence. So um, I was hoping that they were using his understanding of intelligence. Um, but it, it would be hard for me, given that they're taking it online on their own, to funnel them towards one particular understanding. I don't want to jump in. Um, so uh, coming back to Plowman, I, I find this kind of bizarre and fascinating and mysterious. Um, this idea that increasing variety of courses will allow children to have their genetically oriented interests met. It, is there any evidence that some kids are genetically oriented to geography and others to political science? Or is that, like, am I misunderstood? What is he trying to say with that? Um, so 
that argument about increasing choice is, uh, what, is what is the right way to phrase this? <laughs> that people are inclined to pursue things that they do better in. And so the things that they do better in, they are in part doing better in because they have, there's a genetic influence at play which is helping them in that arena. So th by, by offering more choice, students are going to pursue things that they're interested and passionate about, whatever that might be, and there is also potentially this, this driver, uh, genetic influence that is motivating them to make those decisions. Does that make sense? Is there any evidence that that's true? Um, <laughs> there is in terms of, uh, what's it called, shared, Jason, can you help me out? Sh not shared environment. I'm going to have to get back to you on the no, specific I, I, term I for it. But there, question. no, there, there, I have to get back to the specific term. But there is, uh, there is research looking into how people make decisions to pursue certain things and What's it called? I don't know what the term you're using, I, I, but it strikes me that there's evidence of, sh of uh, occupational similarities uh, from like parents to children yeah. and so on that is not irrelevant to that question. I it, find you're, you're, like, you, you're right, you point your finger on politics versus whatever as a narrow, but Cullen probably has more, maybe more in mind, some vocational uh, training, mechanical training versus, okay. you know, so broadening it in a, maybe a different axis or something. And that like is that. one of his policy points as well, is to increase the availability and ease of pursuing vocational trainings. But I will, I will find the specific term that's lost in my mind and get that to you. Yes. I'm curious where this, this choice-based approach, where it lies in relation to the method in which or the, the pedagogy in which topics are taught. Mm. That's a great question. As far as where, where is education on that? So as I think about the VOTEC, what that tends to raise in my mind is, oh, these are people who may organize things visually or spatially in minds more concretely as opposed to more abstractly, et cetera. So that to me is more of a, a pedagogy, the way in which topics are Like taught. learning styles? Is that right? Yeah, so the learning styles and how those then may map onto teaching styles, mm -hmm. regardless of topic of interest, I guess. So, so where, where is education policy in, in that teaching style, learning style, relative to this choice idea? And do you mean education policy as it exists right now, or in terms of these arguments? In both, I guess. Just where, where would that fall in this conversation, mm -hmm. or, or does it? Yeah. No, so that's should that's it be? That's a good question. So, I mean, I can't speak to this with certainty, but as part of my research, I did a number of interviews with behavioral genetics, social genomics researchers. Um, and for them, the idea of learning styles, or if we think of Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences, uh, I, many times I got a little bit of pushback on that idea having a lot of firm ground to stand on. But when I was speaking with teachers, they talked often about multiple intelligences, right? They would say, you know, I know my, some of my students are good at this, and some of my students are good at this, and everybody has a little, dip, bit of, little different bit of whatever it is. And so I think there is a disconnect between um, maybe the social genomics field's view of things like multiple intelligences or learning styles and how, m how highly educators themselves value them. Um, you know, another interesting thing about uh, Asbury and Plowman is they talk a lot about helping teachers to develop the growth mindset and telling teachers, uh, ha making sure that teachers communicate to their students that you have the potential, you can succeed if you work really hard, if you have some grit. Um, and when I spoke with the teachers about this in the focus groups, they would say things like, oh, I know that I should teach growth mindset to my students. Like, that, I want them to embody that message. I don't necessarily fully believe that myself. Like when Florence said, I can only go with Dweck for so long, she's like, yes, I, I want to tell my students that they can do whatever they want. But I also know, and she said at one point, um, not everybody's brain is meant to go to college. And so there, I think also there's a little bit of a disconnect between how teachers teach and maybe the mindset that they 
have that they know I, I shouldn't be sharing this with my students. Yeah, so related, I guess the question I have is, in thinking about the genetics, instead of thinking about topics or college, et cetera, would the genetics inform more of that, the way in which people are predisposed to learn? Mm. Yeah, yeah, they, and they also, you know, talk about whether you might be able to identify if a particular educational intervention, if certain students are more receptive to that intervention. Um, there's the idea of the differential susceptibility theorem, so that different people um, have different responses to certain external stimuli. So, um, you know, if we think of uh, an orchid, an orchid blooms in the right set of circumstances. It needs a lot of specialist careful care. It's easy for you to go wrong with an orchid. Dandelion, on the other hand, is really robust. It can grow through pretty much anything. Um, and so uh, thinking about it from that perspective, whether there are certain educational interventions that the orchids might be really responsive to, but the dandelions would do fine without or alternative, uh, you know, the flip circumstance. Um, so there is conversation about how you might use genetic data to identify who are the orchids and who are the dandelions and who might respond more strongly to an intervention and can you then um, tailor those interventions or perform a, a more cost, cost, what is it, economically beneficial intervention in the sense that you only give that to the students who are more likely to respond positively to it. At risk of dying, because to me what comes in mind is the structure of education. And if we're, out, if yeah. we're geared towards dandelions, but we have a population of orchids, is it an opportunity not to think about it in terms of intervention, but actual restructuring mm -hmm. to bring them about? Maybe we are dealing more with orchids yeah. than with dandelions. Yeah, and I think also, you know, if you look at education as a field more generally, I think there is a bigger openness to personalization as like a very general concept, you know, recognizing, and you know, teachers will say this all the time, that different students need different things, and I think that there's a, a, a growing movement embracing personalization. We see student-centered learning as a big movement. Um, so I think separated from the idea of how genetic research and data might interact with that, there's already a movement where we're saying we need to be rethinking how we teach children, not necessarily teaching them en masse as if they're all going to learn the exact same way. I was just kind of curious uh, if you were able to ask anything about uh, teachers' perceptions of predicted children's abilities and where they'll be going versus assessed. So mm -hmm. teachers themselves, they can see where, I mean, maybe it has to do something with their biases too, but. Uh, what a student is struggling in, where they need help, and they can deliver that help or maybe funnel a student towards an intervention versus having something, using a tool that predicts or tells you what you should be doing ahead of time. So uh, I think there are a couple ways I could answer that. The first thing that comes to mind is, you know, when I was in the focus groups with the teachers, so I didn't directly do what you said, but when I was talking with the teachers in the focus groups, they a couple times would talk about how, well, if I could use genetics as a tool to validate how I feel about the student. So you know, they would talk about, I've had a really hard time trying to convince this parent that this kid needs this particular intervention because the parent says, oh, I see my kid all the time. I know that they don't have uh, an issue with reading. They don't have dyslexia. There's no need. And so their argument was, well, if I can show them, look, this kid is predisposed to develop dyslexia and I'm seeing issues in the classroom, then I would have, a more, I would have an easier time uh, trying to convince the parent that they should be given a specific intervention. I think the other side to that is the large body of work on teacher expectation effects and the fact that uh, teachers, if teachers perceive their students a certain way, that child is more likely to perform relative to how the teachers, how the teachers viewed them. So if a, if a teacher is more likely to see kids as less capable, I mean, the, the classic study is Rosenthal told teachers, oh, these kids in your classroom are gifted. They're like gonna do really well. Randomly selected those kids. Those kids did do really well, in part because the teachers thought, oh, there's something in this kid that they're, that's gonna set them apart make sure that they excel. So that the, there's a whole other separate really big body on teacher expectation effects and the impact that has on student education outcomes. It, it seems I'm really interested 
um, by the way in which sort of the you know, sort of incontrovertible fact that people are different from one another um, is being used to argue against sort of like baseline equity. In some way, right? So it seems like that in in this personalized education narrative, they're saying you know people differ from one another, therefore we can't treat everyone the same. And their response to that is to figure out exactly how different people are and to sort of tailor make thing, tailor make education programs that fit different people, right? But what's been and, and the way that they're proposing that is have some very, very minimum <laughs> set of basic standards and then allow kind of people's genetic predisposition to drive their choices, right? And that sort of makes sense to me if you've got sort of adults <laughs> who kind of know something about themselves and about the world already and have to kind of choose from among the options. But just thinking about sort of like the people in this room, like how many of them would have, you know, in elementary school, <laughs> in fifth grade, like, said, like, I will be a demographer, I will be a population scientist. Like, I, for one, didn't even know what demography was before I ended up in, in graduate school, <laughs> right? And, and so I, it's like, I, I agree that, that there's sort of like value to letting, you know, people make choices and that to some extent pe the choices that people make about things like education will be driven by their sort of own sense of their predisposition, which, which perhaps does have a genetic basis. But coupling that with a really sort of minimum <coughs> basic education as opposed to saying like, right, your, your predisposition, your innate endowment might drive you in a bunch of different directions, but you might not know what that is unless you're exposed to a whole bunch of different things, in which case the choice you make is informed. Mm -hmm. And in the process of creating that informed choice, you give everyone sort of a, a really solid foundation and things that are basic. But this, and, and this is right, a critique more of Pullman, not, not, not your work, obviously, but, but I, so I wonder about this idea of both sort of paring down the minimum into very basic levels, which then sort of removes exposure to a lot of people, of a lot of people to many things, and then saying like, we're gonna just strip everything down to the genetics, right? But, but the very basic, like, who decides what that baseline is, right? Like, do people really know, right, what choice sets they have that their predispositions are driving them to, right? And then finally, like, given sort of all of, of those things, like, how did you choose sort of Plowman particularly as the way of sort of introducing teachers yeah. To, yeah. to this particular? I chose Plowman because he gets some of the most media attention and he puts out a lot of public facing materials like these YouTube videos, like this book. Um, I felt that he was the most accessible to teachers that there might, there might be a situation where it was more likely through his work that a teacher would stumble upon that on their own than anyone else's. So that's in part why I chose him and especially in the UK he, he gets a, a lot of, of media attention. Um, so there's that, but I think the other important thing to recognize is in some ways what he's advocating for is very utopic, right? Because we live in a society where there are certain professions that are not regarded as highly as others, they're not seen as prestigious as others, um, and where there are very structural and systemic inequalities. And so to try and implement a system like this in the context that we have uh, would run the risk of widening inequalities than it would <coughs> narrowing them and I think that that's an important thing that that um, they haven't necessarily thought about you know it also reminds me is in in the book they um, have a chapter on the environment so different different environmental influences and not once did they mention race uh, and I asked them you know why didn't you talk about race at all in this book that seems to me like something that is um, incredibly important, especially if we're talking about discrimination, racism, the impact it has on the ways that people experience environments. And, and the response I got back was, well, race is not as big an issue in the UK, and this was created for a UK audience, um, which is a <laughs> lot to be said about that. Thank you so much. Thank you.